that's a, it's a great honor to be invited here to comment on a great scholar <laughs> in, in Berlin. And uh, I was trying to figure out why I was invited here, but I think I, it's, it's very clear after listening to Professor Offa's lecture that my mission here is to bring some sunshine into this room. <laughs> I can see the gray skies above there. <laughs> But uh, I, I think it's, let me just begin with one important statistical fact that you should take on board before you hear anything I say, that of the 7 billion people in the world, only 12% live in the West. 88% live outside the West. So I'm going to give you the perspective of the world from seen from the eyes of the 88% and not the 12% because the perspective of the 12% is a hugely distorted perspective. And I'll explain why. And as my colleagues in the Lee Kuan Yew School will know, when I'm given 10, point, uh, 10 minutes, I only make three points. So I'm going to divide my remarks into the good news, sunshine, the bad news, why Europe is so grey, <laughs> and some solutions, some concrete solutions, how at the end of the day we would end up hopefully with a more optimistic perspective as we look ahead. Now, let me begin with the good news. Now, Professor Offer began by quoting from a speech that uh, Sikorsky gave in Harvard and said, can we achieve a world with rules? Let me give him some good news. We have done it already. I'm not, I'm not surprised he can't see it. Because if you look around the world as a whole, if you look at any object indicators, and this is the thesis of my latest book, The Great Convergence, the world has never been in a better place. Let's look at three concrete areas. You, Mr. Professor Offer spoke about war and peace. Now, the statistics are very clear. The number of people dying in interstate wars is the lowest it's ever been since statistics have been kept. And if you want proof, you can go look at my book, The Great Convergence. If you want more proof, look at a book by Stephen Pinker, also from Harvard, called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he gives you these dramatic statistics to show the uh, decline of violence and conflict decade after decade. And even if you add in Iraq and Syria and all that, it's a slight blip in terms of the long-term trend that is happening. So the world, and why is that happening? is because most countries now accept the rules that the West created at the end of 1945, especially the rules of the United Nations Charter, which is that you don't invade and occupy countries. And guess what? Invading and occupying countries has gone out of fashion. It used to be the norm in the 19th century. Now it rarely happens, right? And that shows that the world of rules is expanding. And I'm surprised that Mr. Sikorsky can't see that. The second example, okay, if you look at the human condition, we've been trying to eliminate global poverty forever. And then in the year 2000, when our ambassador to the UN, Kofi Annan, in his Millennium Development Goals, announced an ambitious target of halving global poverty by 2015, next year, next month, guess what? We go on to achieve most of the MDGs, but we are going to eliminate, uh, meet the target of halving global poverty and eliminating it. And because of one country called China that has done a remarkable job in lifting people out of poverty. And then if you want another example, look at the size of global middle classes. You want to know why, why these are good times? The total size of the Asian middle class from West Asia to East Asia in the year 2010 was 500 million people. By 2020, six years from now, that number is going to explode from 500 million to 1.75 billion, an increase of three and a half times in 10 years. And if you want the global figures, they're going up from 1.8 billion in 2010 to 3.2 billion in 2020 to 4.9 billion in 2030. More than half the world will be middle class by 2030. And you look at the sky, gray skies and you say, gosh, the sky is falling. Where does that distorted perspective come from? Can't you see that the condition of humanity as a whole has improved so dramatically? So clearly, if you look objectively, and if you want to look at the world of rules, 
the reason why people are prospering in Asia is because they accept the rules-based framework, because China joined the World Trade Organization, placed by the rules of the World Trade Organization, and therefore has emerged as the world's number one trading power. And that's why Germany's exports to China have gone up by 205% or whatever figure you mentioned, Professor Offer. So that's part one. I can give you more good news, but let me deal with the bad news. And here, I must say, if I may be very frank, Professor Offer, from time to time, when I hear Europeans speak about Asia, I do get a slight hint of condescension. And especially when a European says that the Asians only know they are Asians because of a European word called Asia. Now, let me speak from personal experience. I'm a Hindu Sindhi. My family comes from Sindh, which is now part of Pakistan. When I go to Tehran, I'm not a Muslim. I feel a deep sense of cultural affinity. When I travel all over India, of course I feel a sense of cultural affinity. When I go to Southeast Asia, nine out of 10 Southeast Asian countries have a Hindu cultural base. I feel a sense of cultural affinity. When I travel to China, Korea, and Japan, and I see the Buddhist temples there, I feel a sense of Korea, uh, cultural affinity. So if I can individually feel a sense of cultural affinity from Tehran to Tokyo, how can you claim that Asia is, is a Western concept that was given to Asia? I mean, that shows a remarkable lack of understanding of how deep the cultural bedrock of Asians are. And that's the kind of ignorance we have to get out of as we move into a new world. And if you want to understand why there is so much bad news in the papers, let me make a very important proposition that you will never find in a speech by Sikorsky in Harvard. Because the assumption of the Sikorsky speech in Harvard will be that we, the West, are the virtuous ones playing by the rules, while we have to try and persuade the rest of the world to play by our rules. Guess what? People are actually playing by the rules and happy with the rules that the West has given to them, happy with the rules-based order in many areas. But what they see is a West that does not play by its own rules. What they see is a West that violates its own rules. I haven't read the Sikorsky speech, but I would love to go back and Google tonight and see whether he mentioned Iraq. Was Iraq playing by the rules? Or as Kofi Annan said, an illegal war? Did he speak about Guantanamo? Did he speak about the fact that not a single EU government criticized the United States on Guantanamo? Did he mention that? So, you know, the rest of the world sees it and just sees pure double standards. And the double standards make people say, hang on, don't lecture us. Look at yourself in the mirror. And I'm going to briefly address the issue of Ukraine. Because Ukraine has completely distorted European perspectives of what's happening in the world. Now, I agree that the U Russia violated international law with its occupation of Crimea. There's no doubt about that. That's very clear. But why did Russia do that? And here, there's something called geopolitical competence or geopolitical incompetence. There was no necessary reason to violate what the Russians call an understanding at the end of the Cold War, not to expand NATO right to the very doorstep of Russia and make them feel insecure. By the laws of geopolitical logic, Russia should have been drawn closer to Europe because its number one, number one long-term concern is China, not Europe. Europe doesn't threaten Russia. China, he has worried about. It should be moving away from China 
and towards Europe. It takes extraordinary geopolitical competence to push Russia away from Europe into the hands of China and give China the sweetest energy deal of the century of $400 billion at a cheap price, thanks to geopolitical incompetence. And I emphasize that point because I've heard lots of remarks about tensions in South China Sea, tensions in East China Sea. Yes, there are tensions. But look at how they are managed. When I was in Davos, this in January, I took bets with Martin Wolf, with John Mickletwit, the editor of The Economist. They thought there'd be war within China and Japan. I said, there'll be no war. I gave them 10 to 1 odds, and come January, I'm collecting my bets. Because the Asians have a culture of pragmatism that learns how to manage tensions and differences and this culture of pragmatism can be learned by the West today. So let me conclude by my third point by making three concrete suggestions of how the West can strengthen the world of rules that Sikorsky wants to create in the world. Let me give three specific suggestions. Suggestion number one. If you believe in multilateral institutions and processes, you should be strengthening the UN family of organizations, strengthening the World Health Organization, and not deprive it of the funding it needs. Give, put your money where your mouth is, and give money to organizations like World Health Organization, which used to have 75% of the budget coming from regular assess funds, and now only gets 25% of its budget from regular assess funds. Put your money where your mouth is. Number two, if you believe in rules and you believe in democracy, do not have a rule that says that they become the head of the IMF or they become the head of the World Bank. You must be a European or an American and 88% of the world's population do not qualify to run the IMF and the World Bank. Let's play by the rules. Let's vote by whatever you want. You want the voting power to be on share of GNP in the world? Asians will accept that also. Last point. Europe is going to face its most crucial test two years from now. I can assure you that the next Secretary General of Europe, Secretary General of the United Nations will be a European. I guarantee you that. It's Europe's turn. Now, Europe has given one of the worst Secretary Generals of all time, Kurt Waldheim, and one of the best, and probably the best ever Secretary General, Dark Hamashko. So if you, Europe, if you believe in a world of rules, and you want to strengthen multilateral institutions and processes, find one European who has the spine and the steel of a Dark Hamashko and make him Secretary General of the UN, then the rest of the world will believe, yes, Europe believes in rules. Thank you very much. That joining the WTO, for example, was not the relinquishment of sovereignty, uh, uh, which is an argument one often hears, uh, but in fact was the exercise of sovereignty because it was in the national self-interest uh, to create a binding rule framework. I think if you don't have that conception of rules, it's very difficult. Uh, to imagine the underlying rationale to go forward. So the first factor, it's in your national self-interest uh, uh, because unilateral action is insufficient. It's also in your national self-interest to create binding rules when you think the international rule architecture is necessary to achieve a direction of change that you cannot achieve in the absence of that international framework. And I think that has been a motivator uh, for countries to create binding rules uh, repeatedly. We saw that, uh, again, in the economic sphere when, uh, uh, when Mexico chose to join uh, a push for NAFTA. Uh, 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 again, it was not the United States insisting on, on NAFTA. It was Mexico wishing to lock in a reform process thought necessary at home and thinking that a rule architecture would reinforce that direction of change. I think one can be optimistic uh, 
about what is occurring uh, potentially, potentially uh, in Asia and potentially uh, uh, between the United States and Europe by this same thinking, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what is occurring in China and what is occurring in Japan, because I think for very different reasons, both Japan and China, uh, domestic interests have come to think that international frameworks are necessary. They may be regional as against multilateral, but nevertheless, international frameworks are necessary to lock in a reform process that is thought necessary for domestic reasons. I think that's an important uh, characteristic of when binding rules uh, come about. Um, Professor has spoken about um, uh, sanctions. I think uh, rules can be framed when they are sufficiently like-minded nations um, and when there's a rule architecture that exists to enforce them that contains uh, real sanctions or the possibility of real sanctions. But I see looking around the world that at least in the economic sphere, Reputational harm uh, can be as much of a motivator as the actual use and application of sanctions when there's a fundamental sense that the underlying rules uh, make uh, sense. And I think this probably is an echo of what Kishore Mababani has just said when he spoke uh, to the fact that much of Asia, much of the world has accepted the rule architecture along some lines. Uh, 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 that when those norms exist, it's not the existence of sanctions that provide compliance. Uh, it is the reputational harm associated uh, with violation. Um, so when, I, uh, when you ask the question, what's new, and I think you raise many, many important points uh, in that regard, I too uh, look uh, to the fact that there has been a real shift in global sources of growth uh, 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 and geopolitical influence. Uh, and also look uh, 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 to Asia, to Brazil, uh, to uh, uh, what's called emerging uh, markets, but that's really a misnomer in today's world. These are already emerged uh, countries. Um, and of course, uh, a number of these important countries feel that the rule architecture along some lines is too tight uh, and it wasn't of their design completely, even if one accepts uh, uh, Kishore's proposition. Still, uh, the sense that going forward, uh, uh, not only do they want a voice at the table, uh, but they also want a different nuance uh, to the emphasis in the architecture, and one that is, of course, more sympathetic to the domestic sensitivities and priorities that exist. So that will put us, us that, is, that will put some countries' intention uh, 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 along a number of, of, of lines. Finally, let me just uh, offer a comment on uh, whether I think you've raised the important question whether interdependence uh, begets uh, cooperation and uh, if it does, what kind of cooperation. I think it's fair to say that interdependence, again, I speak more from an economic perspective, that economic uh, in interdependence has begotten openness um, uh, uh, but uh, we may have uh, actually uh, crossed the high watermark of binding multilateral rules. Uh, I think that there is far, far more economic integration occurring and having occurred than we have been willing in recent years to bind bind at the multilateral level. What it is, uh, uh, however, uh, uh, producing now is more regional experimentation. 
And I would say, frankly, that a lot of the experimentation uh, that is going on at the regional uh, level offers the promise, the possibility of deeper integration, but thus far, uh, uh, you, you know, not yet proven. When I look at uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific and the Transatlantic uh, initiatives, uh, there are some features in there that are economically meaningful. There are a lot of features in there uh, that are very hortatory, uh, you know, best efforts, uh, kinds of, of uh, uh, efforts to try and bring um, uh, our systems uh, more, uh, more aligned, but that aren't very deep. So I guess I would say that uh, fundamentally, I'm an optimist because I think this interdependence, although uh, it isn't sufficient to eliminate tensions, it is overwhelmingly producing openness. And I think that the opportunities uh, for that going still further, driven by markets and perhaps augmented uh, by rules such as those that are being uh, negotiated, are leading us fundamentally on the economic sphere in a positive direction. So let me stop there.